for joining us for another edition of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and joining me today are three of our panelists, and our topic might give you the willies. This is going to be our insect show. So whatever you're seeing outside, we've been hearing a lot of talk about the cicadas and jumping worms, and so we've got the right crew here that is going to uh, be able to inform us of exactly what we're seeing crawling, buzzing, and flying around outside. So let's have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their specialty. And Ken, we'll start with you. I am Ken Johnson. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension. Um, I cover Calhoun, Cass, Green, Morgan, and Scott counties. And I'm based out of Jacksonville. Uh, I guess my expertise, if you could call that, would be insects, um, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, whatever they are. Um, I also do a lot of stuff with um, fruit and vegetables as well. Okay, awesome. Chris. Uh, my name is Chris Enroth. I am also a horticulture educator with uh, University of Illinois Extension. I'm based in Macomb, Illinois, and uh, both Ken, myself, and our colleague, Katie Parker, you can find us online on the Good Growing blog and podcast. Wonderful. And last but not least, go ahead, Kelly. Um, yeah, just so you know, Chris's expertise is landscaping. Um, and, and I have your number, Kelly. That's would be it, too. Okay. <laughs> I like how he plugged that. Um, my name is <laughs> Kelly Alsup, and I am a, a horticulture educator like um, Ken and Chris. I am based out of Bloomington. Um, my specialty within the team is integrated pest management. Um, so I am uh, trained to kill insects. However, I spend the majority of my time promoting insect conservation. Um, and I work with Ken a lot on projects. So that's me. All right. So this is the bug show, the insect mm -hmm. show. All right. So um, the three of you have put together a presentation um, to share some of the things that folks have been talking about, some of the buzzwords out there that we've seen in the headlines. So um, I'll have you guys just take it away and uh, teach us and tell us what we're seeing outside. Okay, so um, I'm definitely going to refer to Ken and Chris on this, but the very first thing that is really a hot topic in Illinois right now is jumping worms. Um, they are an invasive species um, that really are of great concern for gardeners and for the environment and for our forested areas and our prairies. What this jumping worm, what makes it such a bad um, uh, invasive species, it's not an insect clearly, is that it breaks down organic matter, all of that mulch and old plant material that you may have in your garden at uh, an exceedingly high rate. And so it breaks it down so fast that the uh, plants are unable to take up the nutrients and it can even dry out the soil. So we really um, need to know how to identify jumping worms and how to know if we have them in our backyard. So with that, I'm going to refer to um, Ken to, um, since, you know, he's the entomologist. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to teach you how to identify a jumping worm and how to know if you have it in your garden. Well, do they jump? Can we start with the name? How did they get that name? So I, I've never seen him in person, but, but Chris has, so he can probably tell you a little more than I could. So I will say last week we had a phone call into the McDonough County office and someone said, I think I have these jumping worms on my sidewalk after all of the rain that we had for several weeks. And I went out and I thought, eh, we're, we're rural Illinois, eh, probably not. We'll probably see that popping up in more of the uh, more densely populated areas where there's a lot more landscaping things happening. And I go out, check it out. Sure enough, it was jumping worm. And so their behavior it's kind of snake-like in a way. So when you touch them, they squirm and they kind of go in this like S-shaped squirming motion like a snake would. Um, and I think that kind of uh, freaks some people out. They get a little bit scared when they see something like that. So they definitely do jump. And a, a good telltale identification for these guys is, um, you know, we say kind of they're grayish or tannish colored. 
but color does vary within species. But in terms of their top color and their bottom color, that's different. And so when they're squirming, you see these two flashes of color happening. So that is one diagnostic for identifying them. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, Ken, we're going back to you. Uh, anything to add to that? So in, on that picture, you could see they have that kind of that white milky band on them. <clears throat> and that's kind of the, the other big real diagnostic piece there is that white band, whereas our, the other earthworms we have, the ones that aren't really a concern is more of a reddish or brownish color. So that's, that's probably the easiest two ways is kind of the movement and that white band. One of on the identification words. characteristics that stood out to me, Ken, was they said, um, which forgive me if I um, am mispronouncing this as cytellum, that's the white milky band, mm -hmm. is that for the jumping worm, the white milky band is level. But for the earthworm, the white, the, the band, the cytellum is raised. And then plus the jumping worm, it goes all the way around the worm. For the um, earthworm, it kind of sits like a saddle. So if you look on the underneath, that cytellum is not going to go all the way around. And then I also read that they will actually lose their tails. Did you see mm -hmm. that, Chris? Uh, no, I, I did not pull on its tail. I wasn't being that mean <laughs> to it. Um, so, but an, another thing, so I communicated with our state extension forester, Chris Evans, and another way to identify this, if you want to get up close personal with the magnifying glass, uh, you look for that, wherever that, that band is on that body, it usually begins around the 14th segment of its body. Now, that's very close and accurate. So, and because these guys squirm so much, it's really difficult to, to keep them staying still to identify that. Wow. But does an earthworm squirm? I mean, when you pick up an yeah. earthworm, it squirms a little bit, but usually it's really kind of soft right mm -hmm. this is, feels like there's some muscle behind it you know really? it's like yeah yeah i mean it uh, i know people use these for fishing and that's kind of one of the ways they become established throughout parts of the country here but um i would not know how to get this thing on a hook because it moves a lot wow interesting mm -hmm. so when people um have them do they come to your home in mulch how do you how do you get the infestation how do you get the problem where do they come from well, the person we were dealing with, uh, and this is pretty common, it seems like they had a load of mulch delivered from, uh, it was just a, a large retailer. Um, and they had that delivered last year. She said she started seeing them last year after that. And the interesting thing also with these jumping worms is that they can survive purely off of this, you know, like straight cellulose. So wood mulch, you know, most of our other worms have to go into the soil. These guys, they can just hang out in mulch the entire time and just uh, chomp away on that and and they can survive off of that and so i think a lot of it's getting moved in mulch and compost uh, and things like that so i would say most of our potted plant material uh, is not as much risk because usually that potting mix is uh, pasteurized or sterilized before uh, the commercial growers plant things in there gotcha okay all right kelly i didn't know where you were on your presentation Sorry and so they that. don't overwinter the way the earthworms do and they don't go into the soil the way the earthworms do they kind of stay in the top layers and they're congregate large amounts of them so i'm sure when chris saw um, these he saw multiple specimens in one little small area so, um, you know, earthworms can go down into the soil and they, um, you know, they, that's how they overwinter, but these um, jumping worms cannot overwinter in the state of Illinois, but they overwinter in these little egg cases. And these egg cases is what is found in different materials. And so just in the Master Gardener program, we are encouraging everyone to not share plant material this year, not dig up perennials from your yard and give them to your um, friends or your neighbors. So that's one step that we are taking. We see that Chris found these jumping worms in late May. Well, in all of the literature that I've been reading, we're not really supposed to see um, adult worms until you know later in the season. 
So I, I think there's still a lot for us to learn about jumping worms. And um, if you do think that you have a jumping worm, um, feel free to reach out to your extension office because we're very interested in um, you know, tracking and um, we'll forward you to uh, any place that you um, need to go to report them. As of right now, there's no control for jumping worms. So prevention is really our best key. And um, I know that Ken mentioned this, we, we don't want to use jumping worms for fishing bait. We really need to avoid that. So um, um, next time you go out fishing, make sure you're not using jumping worms as bait. Or no, Chris mentioned it. Okay. Okay. So now the other uh, hot topic that people are discussing are the cicadas. Um, it's been all in the news and I have a couple of photos actually um, that I could share. I found a couple in my yard um, over the weekend, which was pretty cool out uh, discovering with my five-year-old. And so they're here and I haven't heard any noise yet. So maybe you guys can um, let us know when we will, you know, sort of be dealing with that but there are there are a few that i found uh, maybe a dozen or two so far out at our house and we're in rural vermilion county so um i would love to learn more about about these guys and what that's going to look like for us so i guess i can start off with so this is the cicadas we have now are the brood 10 cicadas that come out um, every 17 years so the individuals coming out now have been underground for 17 years they're emerging now um, basically they come out in these giant masses millions, trillions, probably across the country. And kind of the theory is that, you know, they kind of basically overwhelm the systems. They can all mate, reproduce um, before all the predators pick them up. There's just too many of them for them all to be eaten. So that's why they kind of, one of the theories as to why they all kind of come out at once. You can see in this picture, on these pictures here, uh, the periodical cicadas are the ones on the right. So those are gonna be black with red eyes, um, orange wings. Um, compare those to our dog-based cicadas, which typically start emerging in July and August. Um, those are going to be green or brown or black. So these are kind of two completely different types of cicadas. Dog-based cicadas are coming out uh, every year. We get those coming out every year. Um, as far as when they're going to start singing, you know, if they've been coming out, I, I would think relatively soon they'll start singing. And it's only going to be the males singing. So those males are going to call the females to kind of attract them so they can mate um, and then start laying eggs. Awesome. And there was some talk um, about a fungus affecting them this year. Is there anything there that, you know, your average person who enjoys insects at home would would care to learn about? So with the fungus that that'll infect them and it kind of it gets into the abdomen and the abdomen will get all fuzzy and fall off. Um, so oh, <laughs> kind of do cool. they die yeah. after that? Do they die after their abdomen falls off? <laughs> I can't imagine it's too good for them. So I don't, I'm not sure how much longer they last, but wow, yeah, Did it's, not, it's not very good. So if you think in nature, all insects really can succumb to different diseases mm -hmm. or be parasitized by wasp or eaten by other bugs. So, um, you know, that it succumbs to a disease is not, you know, probably doesn't the diseases probably can't wipe out that large of a population gotcha that's what i'm thinking and then um ken so why am i not seeing periodic cicadas in bloomington so kind of the the maps and where we're kind of getting large populations coming out it's that edgar clark crawford vermilion county that's kind of the main areas of illinois um, this weekend here in jacksonville i found one cicada on one of our um, hydrangea bushes. Um, I tried to catch it, but a bird, it flew off and a bird caught it. So I couldn't catch it. And I've heard one cicada calling in a neighbor's tree. So we've got two in Jacksonville that I know of, but we're not, a lot of the rest of the state's not getting, you know, thousands coming out at a time. I know there's been some reports from some in Cook County. In kind of those four counties I mentioned earlier, that's kind of the main area for Illinois. These are primarily coming out in Indiana, <clears throat> at least close to us, and then the eastern, east coast. Um, is where we're seeing most of the population. That's where the, the trillions and, and millions and trillions are going to be coming into play there. And for, so, for us in Illinois, for, sorry, for the rest of the state, we're not really going to, the rest of the state will in 2024, 
we'll have a couple of different broods coming out, a 13-year brood and a 17-year brood coming out. So 2024 will be awesome for cicadas. That'll be the, the bigger <laughs> year for, for folks in Illinois. Um, and I've had a lot of folks talk about wanting to eat them. Let's discuss that for a second. Um, okay, hands are raised already. Uh, Kelly, all right. So Kelly and Ken, I didn't see Chris if you were on team eat cicadas. Eh, kind all of, right. kind of. I'll, I'll, I'll you, try it. Okay. Have you all eaten them before? Have you you've done this before? I haven't. Okay. So. I've eaten insects before. I've eaten grasshoppers and mealworms and just those normal kind of um, ones that marketed. <laughs> those yeah, normal yeah. things. Have you? I mean, wow. you've eaten grasshoppers before, right? And stuff. There's yeah. insects you can buy and stuff. Well, if you guys do indulge, you'll have to uh, you'll have to send us some pictures because there I've seen recipes. There are stir fries and all kinds of. Do you eat the? You eat the actual cicada, right? Ken, you were telling me there's actually like a perfect time to eat them. <laughs> so I will preface this with I have never eaten them, but from what I have read, okay. when they first start coming out and they, they come out of that, that nymphal skin, um, when they emerge, when they're kind of white still, that is supposedly the, the peak quality, best flavor, kind of best mouthfeel, I guess, um, before they kind of harden off is you would grab those kind of white ones that are still hardening and, and blanch them and then eat them. If you don't have those and you're collecting the ones that are have already emerged and they've, and they've hardened, um, you'd usually want to take off the wings and the legs because those can be kind of hard and and stuff. But and I've heard they taste like asparagus, but again, I I can't say for sure. Oh man! Well, anybody out there, if you are going to find yourself enjoying cicadas, please send us a picture on our Facebook or on our Instagram because I would just love to see this. Okay, sorry to interrupt your presentation. Go right ahead with wherever you guys were next. Um, no. So, um, you know, cicadas, they um, don't really damage plants except when they start laying their eggs. And what they do is they lay their eggs in young tree branches. And um, so usually this is not a huge issue. However, you guys, Tanisha, in your county, this may be of concern for you guys. Um, just so much egg laying could potentially damage a tree, uh, especially if it's young. Um, so the next picture is these are wasps and they're beneficial insects. I love talking about cicada killers. Ken knows. Ken knows. I talk about them a lot. What I love about them is I love just everything about them. I love that they're beneficial. So they're cicadas, the female of this um, species, what she'll do is she'll go off, she'll find a cicada, she'll uh, sting it and paralyze it. And then she'll take this cicada back to her underground nest and she'll lay an egg on it. And so when that egg hatches, the larva actually eats that still living sort of in suspension cicada. Now the adult of this species pollinates flowers. So they eat meat when they're young and flowers when they're older. And we get a lot of questions in our extension office when these cicada killers start coming out because the males are quite aggressive and they're up in your business going, who are you? Because they want to make sure you're not another male. But the male is unable to stink. The one that actually comes up to your face can't is harmless. The female can sting because clearly she needs to sting the, the cicadas to bring them back to her nest. But she's too busy working gathering cicadas for her young while the male is pounding his chest <laughs> right okay i'm looking at and, the guys like and he can't yeah. do anything oh can you tell i love that he can't do anything and he can't do anything he can't some, do some anything. good sense nature hat there yes yes so chris the landscape guy where i saw a hole in the ground the cicada killer they nest in the ground. Can you tell us a little bit more about how to avoid them? Yeah, so 
you'll, you'll see them quite a bit on maybe sunny or exposed sites if you have any bare dirt patches, but I tend to see them quite a bit next to sidewalks. Um, so how sidewalks are built, typically they use maybe a sand sub base or next to a patio, they use sand down there. That's really easy to excavate if you're a, a ground burrowing wasp in this case. Uh, so I tend to see those pretty often and there's a little pile of sand outside of the hole. I mean, like Kelly said, the male is gonna be aggressive to you, but it can, he can't hurt you. Um, the female doesn't want anything to do with you. She's going to avoid you. Uh, so just stay away from them. I mean, if you can avoid that spot in your yard, just stay away from it. There's no need to spray anything in this case. Okay. All right. And you guys have a few more photos of some um, insect work. I won't call it damage. <laughs> insect work, uh, if you want to run through those. And, then, and one thing I'll point out for the cicada killers, those aren't out now. Um, those are going to be coming out later in the year when our annual dog day cicadas start coming out. So we're not going to see those until at July, August time frame. July or August. Okay. Okay. But, but Ken, do you think the song of the periodic cicadas is going to bring them out? Is that a thing? No. I think they so. awaken? I think it's, it's, probably, I think it's probably more temperature than oh. anything else. Oh. Okay. Before we move on, I did have um, a lot of people ask, how do they know it's been 17 years? And I just, what in the world? How do they know that it's time? They just do. Nature, nature <laughs> Why does everybody myself. give that answer? <laughs> so you, I, I think every, so with them, I think there was some coming. So some of them kind of get off time. So sometimes with the 17 years, you'll have some coming out four years early. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll have some stragglers. So, I mean, there's not, Again, there's not the large quantity coming out, but you always have some coming out earlier and some stragglers. But as far as how they know how that timing works, I have no idea. Oh man, that is one answer I would love. To, I'm sure you guys too. I've heard people, you know, anecdotally say, "Well, I think it's the the taste of the roots. Something happens on 17 years," and I'm just like, "Really? Is that the real answer?" <laughs> um, but yeah, that would be great to know. But just one of those nature nature mystery. So anyway, okay. Uh, you had some coneflower photos. Yeah. So here I was out doing some yard work this weekend. And um, <clears throat> one of the things we talk about with kind of landscaping for pollinators and stuff like that is leaving some flower stalks behind um, when you're cleaning up your plants. So that's what I did with some of my coneflowers this year. Um, and you can see these flower stalks, they have kind of these pithy centers. Um, and in these, you can see small holes. And I've actually had some bees start excavating out the middle of these flower stalks um, and they're going to utilize those for their nests. So they'll excavate that, they'll start laying eggs in there, um, they'll provision that uh, with pollen and stuff. Uh, these are fairly small holes, so this may be something like a small carpenter bee, uh, something like that, doing that. And I kind of first noticed it because I saw the sawdust all over the leaves. Um, you can see a little bit on that leaf there, but lower down, uh, some of these leaves are completely covered with sawdust. So kind of drew my attention and saw some bee. Uh, so these are going to be solitary female bees. So you're going to have one female per stem there. So I saw a few bees here and they're flying out of these stalks. Um, so if, if you kind of want to provide that habitat for some of our native pollinators, particularly bees, uh, leave some of those flower stalks behind and then lay their eggs in there. And then next spring or summer, depending on the species, they will emerge from that uh, flower stalk. And that flower stalk will break down on its own over time. So this is sort of what we were talking about when um, earlier in the spring, when you guys were saying, please don't clean your beds out, you know, as soon as you have a nice warm day, that's a perfect example of an insect that was using that. So now that is kind of applicable to what we were talking about. Um, we've got about two minutes left and I did, do we have any other photos or um, images that you want, you guys wanted to talk through? Yeah, Ken has a gorgeous image. I mean, look at that image. That's that's a money shot right there. I know, we sure. need to pay him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here, this is one of our native lady beetles, uh, pink ladybug, lady beetle, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this is this particular individual is feeding on some pollen on a strawberry flower. So we think about lady beetles, we usually think about them feeding on aphids and, and other small soft-bodied insects. Um, but a lot of times early in the year before those pest populations get real high, um, they will supplement their diet with pollen. So again, another reason to provide some of these floral resources, not only for, for the pollinators we think about like bees and butterflies and stuff, but also for beetles, they'll do some pollination and, and supplement their diet with it. Okay. 
We've got about one minute left. Um, I've heard folks also talking about the monarchs. So um, when can we expect those guys? Um, we've we've already had sightings. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Uh, yep. Great. They okay. be starting to lay eggs as we speak. So check your milkweed and, and be on the lookout for that. Wonderful. Guys, thank you so much. That went really fast. Um, I hope everybody learned something out there about cicadas and jumping worms and uh, well, cicada killers and all kinds of stuff while you're out in your yard. Um, thank you guys for coming and sharing your time and talents with us. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time. Good night.